Oyez, 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 this court is now in session. Chief Justice Matthew Bailey Begbie presiding. All persons having any business before Her Majesty's judge at this general session of the peace in the judicial district of Caribou, draw near, give your attendance, and you shall be heard. God save the Queen. God save the Queen. Thank you. You may be seated. First of all, I would like to thank you for obeying the command to rise when I entered court. And I should assure you, this is not a personal or selfish whim of mine. This is, in fact, a very important convention. For you see, when I first arrived in Fort Victoria in 1858, well, I carried with me a royal proclamation signed by none other than Her Majesty, good Queen Victoria herself. And this decree stated that I was to be Her Majesty's first official representative here in British Columbia. So it's very simple. When I walk through that door, well, it is precisely as though Queen Victoria herself had graced you with her presence. Now, you might have noticed that you are seeing two relatively young judges sitting before you today. Many people in this colony had scoffed at the idea of having such young judges, but can you imagine sending one of these older, sleek, and more respectable London-based career judges on the walking tour of British Columbia in 1858? I imagine he would likely keel over dead before even reaching Fort Langley. Now, of course, with all due respect, what is needed at our time are young and energetic individuals with keen minds and hearty frames. For imagine, if you will, our very first judicial circuits in the years of 1859 and 60, when we first attempted to bring any sort of law and order to this new colony. They referred to our work as the delivering of the jails. And, well, by that they meant that we would empty all of the jails of prisoners to bring them to trial. But really, that is inasmuch as we had proper jails at the time. Many of our early holding cells were not very secure, didn't hold many people. In fact, uh, Mr. Brew, do you recall the one jail at Lillooet? It was written to have never held for a week any prisoner who wished to escape. Indeed. In, in fact, I often found that that particular jail had rather conveniently delivered itself of prisoners about one week prior to my arrival for about three or four years. Nevertheless, that was our task. We were to travel from one judicial district to the next, bringing all of the prisoners to their trial and dealing with the business of that day. I should mention we seldom enjoyed the luxury of making this travel on horseback. Isn't that right, Mr. Brew? This is true. Uh, quite simply, the terrain was uh, very unforgiving and uh, rough. There were very few usable horse roads at the time, so we were obliged to walk all throughout the colony of British Columbia, several hundred miles at a stretch, and uh, hard going, believe you me. Any one of these excursions could take several weeks or months to complete, and all that walking eight to ten hours virtually every day. So, you see, it's uh, precisely the life for a young, healthy outdoorsman. We would fish for fish, hunt grouse, bake our own bread on the trail, and spend many an evening shivering in godforsaken shelters in the middle of the wilderness. Indeed, but not only must we contend with this unforgiving land as we make our travel, well, we are also forced to deal with very primitive conditions when we do arrive in the various settlements. In fact, for a number of years, uh, you recall we had to hold court outside in a forest clearing. You would be, or the court clerk perhaps, employing a tree stump in place of your desk, yes? Yes, a tree stump or uh, yourself, my lord, you would be atop uh, someone's horse for the proper elevation. Uh, this was an occurrence made all the more interesting on one occasion when, uh, if you can believe such a thing, a passing camel train happened to be uh, coming through this forest clearing, and the uh, horse that Begbie was astride got spooked, bolted off into the woods, and left the Chief Justice of British Columbia flat on his back, staring at, at the sky. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. Who would imagine camels here in British Columbia? The idea is preposterous. 
possibly one of the uh, strangest adjournments in British court history. Indeed. But I must say, even those primitive conditions that we dealt with were infinitely preferable when compared to the early courthouses that were eventually built for us. Take as an example the first one they built in Richfield in 1862. In fact, the term courthouse, well, it's very generous when it comes to describing that building, really what it was was a log cabin. It was some 30 by 16 feet. The ceiling is very low. It was made of canvas. It would often leak dripping water all over the courtroom, ruining government documents for all time. There's no stove to heat ourselves in the colder days, no windows to open for ventilation, no separate jury room either. So at the end of the proceedings, when it is time for the jury to deliberate, all of the spectators in the gallery, as well as the witnesses, the uh, court clerk, even the judge and accused, we would all be forced to wait outside, regardless of the conditions, the torrential downpour of rain, the freezing snow, and the mud. The jury were the only ones who got to stay inside whilst they arrived at their decision. So, needless to say, we expect a very quick verdict in our time. I imagine you're familiar with the expression, your day in court. Well, in our time, it means precisely that. One single day of proceedings. After all, if you had to walk 750 miles two separate times before the snow fell, I imagine you wouldn't devote much time to loitering at all now, would you? No, you would likely conclude your business as quickly as you possibly could, so that you could then make your way on foot to the next settlement and do it all over again. And of course, from there, off to the next settlement, and the next, and the next, all across the colony. Now, this is how a typical day in court would proceed in our time. We would begin the morning of official assizes by impaneling a jury. We would then hear from the witnesses long into the afternoon, and after which the lawyers would briefly sum up their cases. That would be the point that the jury would be dismissed to deliberate their verdict. Now, I should mention, typically in our time, the juries are given no longer than one single hour to arrive at their verdict. Isn't that right, Mr. Brew? This is true, my lord, and uh, should a jury take longer than their allotted time, well, uh, Begbie was known to roar into a jury room from time to time and uh, harangue the poor wretch who could not decide. Thus, the epithet, the haranguing judge. I'm afraid I've never heard that one before, Mr. Brew. Oh, no. <coughs> Nonetheless, our juries were often very difficult to deal with, even at the best of times. Mr. Brew, do you recall a story from the very early years of the uh, colony? There was a horse thief? Ah, yes, the horse thief, yes. There was, uh, well, we, we could give you a bit of a background for this, uh, this uh, rather unfortunate story. There was a very small settlement and a very popular man in this small settlement had been charged in the theft of a horse. And so the lawyers had summed up. The judge believed he had instructed the small town jury as to what the law required in the matter. So he sends them out to deliberate and uh, no more than about five minutes pass and they come back in. And the foreman addresses the judge uh, something like this. My lord, we the jury find the accused to be not guilty, but uh, he has to give back that horse. No, not guilty, but he has to give back the horse. Mr. Foreman, that is an entirely unlawful and frankly an unacceptable verdict which has no place in a court of British law. Now, I thought that I had explained this to you and your jury. If you cannot find the accused man in legal possession of the horse, then you must find him guilty of theft. So, I am going to ask that you take your jury and reconsider this verdict. And so the uh, jury goes back out and uh, re-deliberates, but once more, they very quickly return. And uh, this time it goes a bit more like this. 
My lord, we uh, thought about it, and we the, we, the jury, find the accused to be guilty. But he can keep that horse. As you can see, our juries were not always educated when it comes to the finer points of British law. But nonetheless, we did continue to do our very best to teach all these rough miners a thing or two about British justice. Indeed, and it is this reputation of British justice that helped keep the gold rush relatively peaceful. Well, that and a certain reputation of uh, Judge Begbie himself. Uh, isn't that right, my lord? Oh, yes, I do admit I did have a bit of a reputation to have a short temper, but... Well, this made the job significantly easier. After all, I can recall some, perhaps, 15 separate occasions where we would be walking down the hills into a very busy mining town at the peak of this gold rush, and there was not a single court case to be held. Yes, I respectfully suggest that this reputation of mine served the colony for some good. And that it did. And uh, along with this reputation came... Uh... Well, a rather unfortunate nickname that uh, well, I'm sure you might have heard, uh, Lord, the uh, Hanging Judge nickname. Very well. Um, let me assure you, any stories that you might have heard of me being a Hanging Judge, well, they are simply stories. Stories that were written by a gang of colleanly, drunken, barber-mongering hacks reporters who never once bothered to check the facts. And I must say that not a single one of these lily-livered, one-trunk inheriting rascals ever had the courage to use this damnable nickname for me until four years after I passed away. Reporters indeed. Well, this title of Hanging Judge didn't uh, even properly belong to Begbie in the first place, did it? No, it belonged to a 17th century British judge named Jeffreys. And uh, Jeffreys and Begbie did share a few qualities. They were both known for their harshness and their temper. But Jeffreys was also known for his keen wit and his exceedingly long memory. It was not often that you could get the better of Jeffreys while in his courtroom. No, 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 but there, there was one fellow, um, a rather petty criminal. This man had been appearing before Jeffreys for perhaps the third or fourth time in his life. And as Mr. Brew had mentioned, Jeffreys had a very good memory. So when he entered the courtroom, well, he immediately recognized the criminal standing before him. So Jeffreys makes his way behind the bench. He takes his cane, he brandishes it towards the criminal. And then he declares, sir, there is a villain at the end of this cane. To which the criminal replies, Yes, but at which end, my lord? And I can assure you that after a cheeky response like that, well, that petty criminal never appeared before Judge Jeffreys again. I doubt he appeared before anything ever again. <clears throat> Truly. But uh, we are digressing. And I, for one, believe that I might actually know what it was that has garnered this hanging judge title for me. And believe me, it has nothing to do with the amount of people sentenced to hang. Truly, if you were to compare that to other gold rushes of this time, you'd find that it is respectably small. No, I believe it might have a little more to do with the, um, the tirades that I could often launch from behind my bench. And I have often been told that these were rather, um, difficult to bear. Take, for an example, the uh, Gilchrist case. Uh, would you provide them with some details? Uh, yes, the Gilchrist case. Uh, first of all, Mr. Gilchrist, the accused, and uh, his friends had rather had uh, concocted a rather elaborate scheme in which they would stage an argument in a saloon in Williams Lake. They would, you know, draw their pistols and accidentally shoot another man sitting across the room, uninvolved. Well, their plan ended up going off without a hitch, with the one notable exception that in the skirmish, they shot and killed the wrong man. Secondly, the jury in this case was comprised of uh, a number of Mr. Gilchrist's friends and uh, 
they had returned to Judge Begbie with the verdict of only manslaughter, where one of murder was clearly what was required. So the time came for his lordship to pronounce sentence, and it went something like this. Prisoner, it is far from a pleasant duty for me to sentence you only to imprisonment for life. I feel as though, through some incomprehensible reason, that I am prevented from doing my proper duty. Your crime was unmitigated and diabolical murder. You deserve to be hanged. Had the jury performed their proper duty, then I might now have the painful satisfaction of condemning you to death. And you, gentlemen of the jury, you are nothing more than a pack of Dallas horse thieves. And permit me to say that it would give me very great pleasure to see you hanged, each and every one of you, for declaring a murderer guilty of only manslaughter. And, uh, here I stand, wondering why you now call me the Hanging Judge. Well, I suppose I have been called worse things, both in life and even afterwards in death, so I suppose you can call me precisely what you will. You see, I've come to learn one very important thing in my time, and that is that even we, the High Court judges, well, we stand to be judged ourselves just as everyone else, of course, by history. And if I can leave you with one thing, I hope that you will remember this. A very wise man by the name of Oliver Wendell Holmes had once written, the life of the law lies not in logic, but in experience. And this is a lesson that I have come to learn for myself over all these years. In fact, I often wonder how many people in this colony have neglected to acknowledge the benefit of having men of such simple experience attempt to bring any sort of law and order to this new colony? In fact, that might be why. Well, some people are now beginning to say that we made some bad law. I admit it might not have been perfect, but you want to know something? By God, it was damned good justice. At least, and it was for us, I imagine, well, only history can tell. And with that, court is now adjourned. All rise. God save the Queen. God save the Queen. 